to figure out my Zoom thing here. So good morning, everybody. My name is Naila Souter, as Shirley said. Um, I am an environmental health specialist with Contra Costa County. Thank you guys so much for having me this morning. I'm really excited to talk to you guys about the environmental health career. So um, before I start the presentation, environmental health specialist is the um, fancy name or the license name for what you guys would probably know as health inspectors. Um, many years ago, they used to be called sanitation, sanitation specialists, I do believe, um, but now we are considered environmental health specialists. Um, here in California, it requires a license, which I'll go through in the presentation. A lot of other states um, and jurisdictions may not require licenses for these positions and they may be called something else, but generally environmental specialists is along the lines of what this career is. So um, I will go ahead and get started here. Um, got about nine slides. I'll just take my time and go through. If you guys do have questions that are kind of relevant to the specific slide, I'm okay with answering some questions before I move on or we can wait till the end, whichever you find flows best for you, Shirley. All right, so give me just a second to share my screen. This is my first virtual PowerPoint presentation. So be graceful with me, please. <laughs> All right, are you guys seeing that? I hope so. Okay, so um, and thumbs up if you guys can see it. See the PowerPoint, okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, so environmental health specialists. Um, again, I said registered because not all positions are gonna be registered, but if you wanna be in a specialist here in California, um, you do have to get registered to work with most government agencies. Um, I have a bachelor's of science in health science from Cal State East Bay. I'm a registered environmental health specialist. I've taken about four classes on a master's in environmental policy and management, um, but that's moving slowly. So hopefully I will add that to my credentialing soon. Um, and again, I work for Contra Costa County and their environmental health division. All right, so what is environmental health? Let me just move some things around here. Okay, so environmental health, and this is taken right from Google. It's the branch of public health concern with monitoring or mitigating those factors in the environment that affect human health and disease. So basically we work with the public to make sure that they're being safe within the environment. And that may be on the environment as in pollution or water quality. It could be food safety and pool safety. Um, it's a lot of different areas of environmental health. So I've listed off some here. Food is a big one. So anywhere that sells food pretty much will have an inspector here in California, whether it's the local grocery store, a gas station that just sells candy and chips, or a full-blown restaurant, sit down, fine dining. They all will be having inspections. They all will have permits that come from the health department. Uh, land use is another big area of environmental health. Land use are inspectors in that division. So they're working with people who are building typically. So like septic systems, which is a way of disposing of our personal waste. Um, most of us have a toilet that's hooked into a sewer system that's taken care of of either the city or county or some jurisdiction. Um, but people who live in remote areas or build homes in areas that are not able to connect to sewer often have to build septic tanks. So we have um, inspectors that go out and make sure that they're building those tanks properly at the right footage and so on and so forth to make sure that the waste is being disposed of properly. Um, land use also works with well monitoring. So when different agencies need to do well monitoring down in the ground, they need to drill in, take out wells, so on and so forth, they work with that as well. Um, we have solid waste. So solid wastes are, they typically are gonna be working with what's called a transfer station, which is pretty much when we put our trash cans out on the curb and the trash man picks it up, he takes it to this huge facility. Um, it's called a transfer station. Um, they also are gonna oversee landfills. So where our trash actually ends up. And I have a short video in the PowerPoint that I may show if we have time um, that really shows the behind the scenes on landfills, it's really cool. Um, they also will do compost facilities. So facilities that are creating compost for gardening, landscaping, so on and so forth. Our solid waste team does that. Um, Contra Costa also oversees, and this is not general to Contra Costa, these different areas. Um, Contra Costa County Environmental Health actually doesn't have all these areas underneath of our jurisdiction. 
Um, so we have body art, which I actually just became recently a co-lead for the body art program in Contra Costa County. So I'm really excited about that. Body art oversees uh, tattoo parlors, body piercing, permanent cosmetics. So the uh, the tattooing, eyebrows, things of that nature would be considered permanent cosmetics. We do in, um, inspect and permit those facilities in Contra Costa County. We have medical waste, which is kind of along the lines of solid waste, but it's specific to like biohazardous waste, the type of waste you're going to see in dental clinics, veterinary hospitals, large hospitals. So we might go to John Muir or any other large hospital and inspect how they're keeping their biohazardous waste and make sure it's being disposed of properly. Now, recreational health. So that's mostly pools and spas. So we don't inspect personal pools and spas, but anywhere like a YMCA, apartment complex, um, a gym, all those type of places are inspected by us. Uh, we will be testing chemistry, making sure the chlorine levels are right for spas. You have to make sure that the heat is right, make sure that they have all the signage up and so on and so forth. Um, small water systems, we have one inspector that does oversee small water systems. So the water that comes into our homes, um, the systems that feed that um, he oversees. Uh, large water systems is overseen by the state of California. Um, vector control, which is not, so in Contra Costa County, vector control is its own division. It's not under environmental health, um, but in other counties, it is a part of environmental health. So vector control is going to be your, your critters, um, you know, going out and working with the rats and <laughs> different type of infestations, kind of learning about their habits, how to identify them, helping people get rid of them, so on and so forth. That would be vector control. They also work with mosquito abatement, um, cockroaches, and a couple other different type of vectors. Hazmat, um, again, in Contra Costa, Hazmat is its own entity. Hazmat is actually a really cool career. Um, if you're interested in hazmat or becoming a hazardous material specialist down the road, um, they are more science heavy as a career. So I would uh, recommend more of those chemistry, biology type majors, physics majors. Um, hazmat is, they like hard science degrees is what they call it. But hazardous materials, they might see, you know, if a, a truck overturns on the freeway and it's carrying gasoline, hazmat might respond. Uh, recently, we had some issues at some of the refineries in Contra Costa County. Uh, hazmat will respond to that. Um, if there's a chlorine gas leak at a plant or something, hazmat would be out there. Um, pollution control, again, not in Contra Costa, but it is other counties will oversee pollution control. They might do air quality monitoring, um, water mo monitoring, so on and so forth. And then stormwater, um, which is the water that goes down the, the grates on the ground. There are agencies that inspect the stormwater to make sure things are not getting into the systems, that the water quality is good, and so on and so forth. Um, so those are just a few of the areas. I'm sure there's many, many more, but those are some of the big ones that um, most public, most of the public interact with for environmental health. Here on the left-hand side, I've included a picture. This is actually a picture from the city of Berkeley's environmental health, their actual website. Um, and I just thought it was cool because it's kind of an image of what they we kind of do. So up top, it looks like they're probably inspecting a building. Um, building inspection may not always be under environmental health. Sometimes that's under like building departments or house and safety, um, but it looks like they may be doing some building. They could also be doing vector control, right? They could be looking for critters. Um, to the top right, we have the gentleman, it looks like he's doing some water quality testing. Um, in our department, we do monitor beaches for blue algae a type of algae that's harmful to a cyanobacteria, I think is what the scientific name. So we do monitor some of the beaches, um, areas where people might get into the water to make sure it's safe for animals and pets. So he may be doing something like that. Um, down here in the bottom left, looks like he could be doing food inspections. And um, there's no food out, so he might be doing what's called a plan review. He might be looking over the structure of the restaurant to make sure it has everything it needs, to make sure it meets the code, so on and so forth. Um, in the bottom right, we have what looks like an actual food inspection. So that looks kind of like a temp event. We um, inspect events, temp events, which could be carnivals, it could be fairs, um, it could be food drives, a church event, anywhere where you're going to be having vendors coming and bringing food and serving to the public. Uh, we would also be out there inspecting and permitting them. Okay, so that's environmental health in a nutshell. 
All right, so we'll get into the educational requirements and I will take this slow and keep it light. Um, to become an environmental specialist in California does require some educational background. Um, and I'll talk to you guys a little bit about my background. I took the scenic route. So I wanna encourage you if you're not ready to jump into a four year degree that there's many other ways to go to school and still end up in the same spot that you want um, to reach the same goal. So for us here in California, it requires a bachelor's degree. 30 semester units of science. And I'll talk a little bit more about what type of sciences they're looking for. So basically you gotta go to school, get your four-year degree. And when you're getting that degree, you just wanna make sure you have at least 30 units of specific sciences. Um, once you have a degree, you are eligible to become a trainee. So what happens is you will take your degree and your transcripts, you would send it off to California Department of Public Health. They will evaluate your transcripts to make sure you've met the educational requirements. And then they issue what is called a training letter. So they'll basically certify you to say, hey, this person's done the educational background, county departments, you can hire them as a trainee. Um, there is a way around, I think CSU and Northridge and maybe a couple other colleges have environmental health programs. So you can actually go major in environmental health. And if you complete a degree at one of those schools, you don't have to be a trainee. So it's kind of like a fast track straight to just taking the test and, and getting into the career. I think we have one person at my department that has done it that way. And then once it's all said and done, you have to take a test. It was about a six hour test. It was uh, pretty intense, <laughs> but I will say Contra Costa County is a great training county. Um, oops. I was fully prepared um, to take the test and many of us do pass, um, but it is, it is an intense test. It's gonna follow, cover all those areas I just talked about. It might ask you about different rats. It might ask you about chlorine and just all kinds of different stuff. And once you pass that test, you're registered and you pretty much are in the career. So as far as the specific educational requirements, um, there's kind of like two routes. I'll consider it the easier and a little more intense route. So there's 30 units, which you can see here on your left, you're gonna want college algebra, biology with lecture, chemistry, micro, organic chem or physics. A lot of these type of classes are gonna be in your biology, chemistry, micro majors. I was a health science major. I took most of these classes just as a health science major. Um, I did have to go back to school after finishing my bachelor's, I had to go back to a community college and take additional classes because I did not have all the classes in my degree. So that's always an option. If you want to major in something else, you can always take the classes at a later date. Um, the one here on the right, um, it's just, a, just the same kind of thing. This one doesn't have the lecture in lab. I think this is like if you take classes where you're just doing lecture, three of them must have lab or something with them. Um, the thing with the classes is the more science you take, specific sciences, the less time you have to train. That'll make more sense on the, less, in the next slide. Um, but basically, once you finish your educational requirements, you go to school and you take the classes you need. Um, you can be a trainee from, I think, six months all the way up to 18 months. So that's the time that you have to be employed with the department as a trainee. So you're making less money, you're not registered, um, you're getting the training that you need to take the test. And the more education you have, the less training you need. So when I finished, I do believe I was 18 months, 12 months, 18 months. So I had to, and I think they knocked off some time for experience or something. So I might've been 12 months. So basically I had to be a trainee with Contra Costa County before for 12 months before I could actually take the test um, to get licensed. All right, so here, some pictures on the left. I'll talk a little bit more about the pictures on the right. Here is actually the training plan that comes from the actual Department of Public Health. And this little, I don't know if I put it on the last slide, but here, this little green computer down in the far right hand, there's a link that will take you straight to the Department of Public Health website. So you can print out these docs for anybody that's interested in looking more into the career later. Um, so this is their training plan. So when I was hired as Contra Costa, um, this is what my supervisor, I was working with her with. So you have all these different areas and you can see everything from the body art that we talked about to vector control down to some of these um, less frequently seen areas, which could be milk and dairy products, noise control, land development, disaster and sanitation. So there's all these different things that you can train in. 
Um, you have to get a certain amount of hours. I won't go into all of that in this presentation, but a certain amount of hours and so many different areas to say that, hey, I've met the training requirement to be able to take the test. Um, my training with Contra Costa County was, was pretty cool. I got to go to water systems, um, the operating plants for water systems. I got to go into, I do think it was the shale refinery there in Martinez, um, which was a really cool experience. Um, I became hazmat certified. I went through hazmat training. Um, so the counties will really invest in this career. They'll invest in you and you get to do, a, you get to learn a lot of different things and get a lot of different credentialing, even though it may not be something you do in your everyday. Um, but again, the pictures here, it's just some pictures of things you would probably really see while you're training. So obviously a diner up there, you're gonna, it's heavy on the food. You have to know how to inspect uh, retail food facilities. And then you see the refinery there. So again, our, our land use people do go on to refineries when they're doing drilling for wells and stuff, but typically hazmat will be the primary division that deals with uh, refineries. Um, then here you have pH and chlorine. So this is a, a pool test kit. So when we're testing our pools, we're typically gonna have something that looks like this, um, where you're doing some basic chemistry type measurements with the water and you're reading for chlorine levels, pH levels to make sure they're safe. Um, and here is actually the video of um, the land use, it's a landfill. So this is a video of some of a place in UK. And I, since we have some time, I'll show it. It's only three minutes. Um, it kind of just lets you guys see what you would really see if you were in this career. If you were really in a landfill, the video does kind of encourage sustainability and things. Um, but I'll go ahead and, and play that. Let me see if that will open, hopefully. And that does not look like it opened here. Okay. Give me just a second, you guys. Let me try to troubleshoot this. This is my first time trying to put a link in something. So let's see if it's gonna work out for us. It doesn't. It looks like it just wants to pull up the picture. I'm not sure why it's not pulling up the YouTube, but I'm not going to waste too much time with that. Um, but it is a cool video if you're able to watch it later. So basically, oops, they're just showing you behind the scenes. I will say personally, one of the most eye-opening things that I learned in this career while I was training had to do with solid waste and waste disposal. Um, when you actually get a chance to go and see where our trash ends up, you have a little bit more appreciation, I think, for the trash that you create. So I'm um, actually seeing it dumped into, you know, the ground and covered with dirt right next to a beautiful little creek with ducks and stuff, you know, many of us in the environmental health division um, definitely try to encourage sustainability. But um, you could be working on landfills if you were environmental health specialist. Okay, so let's talk about the money. After you spend all that time in school, how much money am I going to make? That's what we want to know, right? Um, so I'll start off by saying here goes some of the counties. Um, oh, goodness, sorry, I'm trying to move this uh, view box. I can see all of us, but I can't, it's in the front of my presentation. And I can't quite figure out how to move it. Okay, there we go. Um, so, you know, how much am I going to make after all of this work? So Contra Costa is a pretty nicely paid county. And this is a monthly salary that I went ahead and shared. Um, Marin County is going to be a little bit higher. It's a county that has a little bit more money in the county. So some of the counties with a lot of more revenue, you might get paid more. San Francisco County is one of the highest paid counties in um, California for environmental specialists because San Francisco is a very wealthy county. Sacramento County is um, a little bit on lower on the scale, but not bad. Um, and so I broke it down here into the different, I'm sorry, give me just a second, you guys, I, I need to figure out how to move the box with all your beautiful faces um, down a bit. There we go. <laughs> um, so as a trainee, trainees don't make as much, just like if you were to graduate from med school and go to your residency, you're not going to make as much as a resident as a, a full on doctor. So it's kind of the same, same thing trainees are going to make a little bit less. I think Contra Costa was starting out in the 30s, something like that. Um, the other counties looks pretty similar. Once you're registered, so once you've passed your test and you've been licensed by the state of California, um, your pay goes up significantly. 
Um, so contra cost to county, now you're looking at about 6,000 to 8,000 a month, um, which could equate from 80,000 to I think the high 90s. Um, we're in a little more, Sacramento a little less. Um, and then for most, one great thing about this career, and I'll just segue just for a second. So before I got into this career, I worked at Solano County Public Health Lab. I was a lab technician and it was a director there that actually introduced me to this career. Um, and I will say that one of my reasons for choosing environmental health specialists over becoming a microbiologist was the career growth. So with environmental health specialists, you have seniors, you have supervisors, you have managers, you can go program directors. It's a career that will allow you to grow and do a lot of different things. And so that's why I actually chose this career over becoming a microbiologist. No discredit to microbiologists. I have friends who are, and it's a great career as well. Um, but I wanted something that would allow me to be able to do different things. And so seniors um, with Contra Costa County, once you've been a registered inspector for two years, they will actually bump you right up to a senior. Our seniors make 90 to $100,000 and up. Um, most counties may not do that. You may have to wait for positions to open, um, but the way Contra Costa does it is pretty sweet. You actually just stay on the job and have two years, they will bump you up. Um, so San Mateo County is another high paying one around here. Um, Alameda County is pretty equivalent to Contra Costa. San Fran, as I stated, is, is higher up there. Some of the Southern California counties actually are not as high. You would think like so San Diego, Los Angeles, um, some of them are actually lower than us. Not quite sure why, but um, some of the counties down in Southern California do not make as much. If you go remote, so if you want to El Dorado County, um, Shasta County, you're going to make less because the counties are smaller. Um, but here in the Bay Area, it is an, um, a lucrative career. You can support yourself off of definitely. Okay, so career outlook. Um, so some of the benefits of having this career. One, I will say first is job security. Um, I did not really understand the full job security of this job when I got into it. But as I've gotten into it, I'm actually really happy to be an environmental specialist. So we're considered disaster service workers. Many of us are um, disaster service trained. We've gone to FEMA training. So pretty much you have a career once you're licensed that you could do a lot of different things. You're always going to be in demand. The skills that we have that we're trained to have are valuable to a lot of agencies. So if there's a disaster, we can go out and check the water systems. We can go out and make sure that the food setup is safe. We can make sure that the waste disposal is safe. So you get all these different types of trainings that make you very valuable to different agencies um, at different points, especially during emergency response. So you don't really have to worry about not getting a job or having a job with this kind of career. Again, specialized skills and training. Um, so speaking to you guys today is something cool that I'm getting to do in my job. That's a little different than my normal. Um, as I stated, I'm hazmat certified. We've gone through shellfish, tanks, certs. I mean, FEMA, we've, we've gone to a lot of trainings and skills. Um, Contra Costa really invest in their employees. So you would get a lot of credentialing just by being in this career. The salary, again, if you work at certain counties and certain, even private, I don't always want to say you don't have to be a government employee. Um, there are many private agencies that and employ environmental health specialists and you don't always have to be registered and you can make just as much in a private industry as well. So that kind of touches on the employment options. You can go government, private, nonprofit. I mean, a lot of different people are going to need your skills. Um, and then the team, I think uh, the division is really a great place to work. We're very close. We all work together. Um, you know, we train each other. And so just the team is a really, you get to know your coworkers and you kind of depend on them. And it's, it's, it's a neat, a really cool setup. So challenges, there are challenges to this career for sure. Um, this was my first job as an enforcement officer, a regulator, so to speak. Um, I had always worked in customer service or some position where, you know, I wasn't necessarily enforcing anything on anybody. Um, so this was my first one ever doing that. It, it, it took some time to get used to that. There are individuals who may not like, you know, the health department or government agencies or just enforcers or, you know, whatever. Um, so it took me a while to get used to people 
having sometimes negative outlooks on me before they got to know me. Um, and, you know, you get to understand, don't take it personal. You know, it just, maybe they had a bad inspector one time and now all inspectors are bad. Like it, it could be that simple, but you are an enforce in an enforcement role. You are going to potentially be closing restaurants, closing pools, doing things that people may not be happy about, <laughs> um, but it comes with the job. Um, and I'll actually show you guys here. We are, we're not officers in the sense of like a police officer, but once you become at work for the county and you register, they do give you a badge. Um, it says environmental health specialist and it has a number. So this is actually part of our enforcement. If we have to enter into a place during emergency response, we're basically, um, we enforce the public health officers orders, so to speak. So right now we are doing enforcement for COVID. We don't use our badge often because you can't just be flashing it because we're not officers, but um, it is cool. You know, you actually are um, given certain powers by the county that you're employed with. Um, so changing laws and legislations that can be sometimes difficult depending on what lobbying is going on, what's going on in the world, the climate, the science industry, you know, laws can change and it can affect us. So we, so say for food, we enforce the California Retail Food Code. If that food code changes, then our job changes, you know, the second that that is published. Um, in Contra Costa County, there was a big push for what they call micro kitchens, um, where you can make certain foods at home because a lot of people don't have the money to do a, you know, brick and mortar restaurant. So they wanted to be able to cook at home and then sell to the public. So there was a big push for that. Um, that could really drastically change our, our day to day operations because we don't typically go into people's residences and things like that. So the laws can change um, varying work conditions. So, you know, if you're working in a restaurant, you could be in a restaurant that's maybe 100 feet square feet big, you know, it could be just a cook line, you could be in the landfill, right? And I, I've been in the landfills, there's pigeons and seagulls flying all over, you know, you might get pooped on, it's hot, um, there's not a lot of access to bathrooms, it's dirty, <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, if you're out in the middle of Orenda where somebody's building a beautiful mansion and you're putting in their septic tank and it's just dirt and you're a lady and there's no restroom, I mean, it could get, you know, it, the conditions can get interesting. So that's one thing, you have to be open to, you know, maybe getting dirty sometimes, being out in the rain sometimes, it just depends on what area you're working in. So the exam can be a challenge. I don't want to deter anybody from trying. It's not like, you know, rocket science exam. If you put the time in school, you get trained and you pay attention during your training, you will be fully equipped to take the exam. But it is that extra hurdle to getting to um, in the career. Um, public service can be a challenge. I enjoy working with the public. I enjoy the educational part of this job. I like teaching. I like working with what we call operators, which are the owners of restaurants and different facilities. I like working with them to understand what they do, to you know, meet in the middle of making sure they're in compliance, but you know, really learning. So I like that. I enjoy the public service. Some days, you know, it can get to be a challenge depending on who you're working with, right? We all have worked with people where sometimes, you know, you gotta really keep it professional. Um, but the public service can be a challenge because we are public servants. Um, just like right now, I'm gonna be helping with disaster service work. So I'll be helping with the COVID vaccines and that's a different aspect of public service. It's gonna put me in a different role, which could be challenging. Um, emergency response. So we have a huge emergency response branch at our division. So again, um, the COVID vaccines, we are actually responding with emergency response now with environmental health. So um, we had, I think we have an inspector that went out to Santa Cruz to do the cleanup for the fires. We have another one that's gonna be leaving soon. We had people that went up to Paradise to help after the, those wildfires um, in Napa. So we do work with other agencies sometimes to be deployed out to also be support for emergency response. Okay, so this is a day in my life. So just some pictures. These actually came from my actual phone throughout my days of inspecting. I did not have pictures from my training experiences, but I'll just kind of go through a little bit of what you're looking at here. So we'll start at the top. So what you have there is a lovely dirty tool that somebody used for something that's stuck inside the chicken basket. And I actually walked in, you know, and they're prepping the chicken and screwing the machine and then just stuck it in there. <laughs> 
which I'll say it's probably not the worst thing in the world, right? Because it's raw chicken. We're hopefully going to cook it to a proper temperature, maybe kill off bacteria, but you don't want to walk into a restaurant and that's, you know, you don't want to see that, right? So stuff like that. Um, that's a closed placard. So that's a facility back in January last year that I had to close for whatever reason. Um, so like I said, that enforcement role, you know, telling somebody, hey, you're gonna have to stop operations and close your business. It may not be the best day for you, but that's a part of your role. Um, to the right of that, the warning sign is a pool. So I had to close a pool facility. That's actually a spa at a housing community. Um, I think the chlorine was too high or something like that. So we had to close the pool. Again, you're not probably going to be anybody's favorite person on the nice summer day when you close down the spa, but you're keeping people safe. Um, here in the middle with the colorful umbrella, we have what we consider unpermitted vendors. Okay. And I say that with all grace. Okay. Not everybody's able to start a restaurant. Not everybody's able to go out and get all the permits. Okay. Um, some counties, deal with unpermitted vendors different various ways. Here in Contra Costa County, if you don't have a permit to be selling food to the public, you're not supposed to be doing it. So if we get complaints about vendors and stuff, we may go out, contact them, try to help them get permitted. Um, we do have mobile foods. Uh, that's actually another division. So we, we do food trucks. So we try to talk to them to help, help them get permitted to do it legally. Um, next to that is a 65 degrees. So that's curry. Uh, yellow curry, which is my favorite. And I was at a Thai restaurant. Um, the 65 degrees is the temperature of the curry in Fahrenheit. So I came into an inspection. Um, I tempted, this was in the refrigerator. So most refrigerators, just so you know, 41 degrees Fahrenheit and below is what we typically look for. So that's pretty, that's pretty warm. So that caught my attention. I asked them, you know, when did you make it? So on and so forth. Come to find out they made it the night before. Um, they left it out in like the dining area to cool down, so to speak, overnight. Um, it has milk and things in it. So that's just not proper cooling. So that's a food that actually ended up getting thrown out. They had to throw all of it out. Um, so you could be doing stuff like that. It wasn't the funnest because they, they were getting ready to open for lunch and I'm throwing out all their curry, but you know, I'm keeping people safe. So just always keep that in mind. You're here to keep people safe. Um, down to the far right, we just have a regular cook line. So that's probably one day when I was doing what's considered plan review. Um, so going in a restaurant, making sure you know you have the right fume hood system, the right stove, just making sure you're, you're in code to have the facility. Next to that is what's it's penicillin, some type of medication that's not supposed to be sold over the counter. So we did have a division that was doing illegal pharmaceuticals for a while. Um, going to different markets in different areas that may be getting some of these uh, prescription drugs or prescription ointments from other countries and selling them here. So we were kind of looking into that for a while. In the middle there, it's just, you know, the chicken, the phones, it just doesn't look too good, right? It's <laughs> so this was actually a popular burger joint that I was at. And, you know, I gave the guy some grace because he was working by himself. But, you know, here is where you have potential cross-contamination, right? This is the type of issues where you're just moving too fast, you're touching the phone, you're touching the food, you're touching everything, and this is how stuff starts to happen. So just, a, you know, this would be an educational moment. This wouldn't be a no moment where I'd necessarily come in and shut you down or do some crazy drastic. This is where I'm gonna talk to you. This is where we're gonna try to figure out your, your food flow, what are you doing, what's your process, and where you use the knowledge that you've been trained to have to help train them to do things better. Next to that, if you see the tiny little bug in the middle, so I had to zoom, zoom, zoom. That is called a nymph cockroach. <laughs> so it's considered a baby cockroach. So those, it's, that's a pretty zoomed in. So if you see, that's a tile on a, in a kitchen. So, you know, tiles are about what, three inches by three inches. That's how small that baby nymph is. Um, you will get your cockroach eyes, you'll get your rat eyes, you'll, you'll get trained to, to spot those things out in the middle of a, you know, of a kitchen. So we are always looking for, for, for that, unfortunately, it is a part of the restaurant industry often, you know, sometimes things happen, you know, cockroaches might come in on a shipment box from something that you bought and you didn't even know and now you have an issue going on. Um, so we are looking for cockroaches sometimes, rats, mice, I have seen quite a few when I first started as a trainee. Um, I won't say what restaurant, I think I was in Antioch, maybe or Pittsburgh somewhere. Um, my first cockroach <laughs> infestation. And I was lucky in life. I didn't grow up really exposed to cockroaches, you know. Um, you know, hopefully most of us are lucky like that. 
Um, I went into a restaurant. I won't even say what type of food because it doesn't matter. Um, cockroaches and vermin are not specific to any type of food, ethnicity or, or culture. Okay. Um, so I went in and, you know, I, I'm not experienced at this point. So I really don't know what to look for. And my trainer says, Hey, look down there. And I see this little bug and I'm like, oh, okay. It looks like a baby roach. All right. You know, whatever. She's like, well, well, there's babies, there's mamas. Okay. So <laughs> we got to dig in a little more. And within 10 minutes, I had been in the facility, maybe 20 minutes within 10 of seeing that baby roaches were everywhere. They were on the ceiling. They were above the cook line. They were crawling on the tables. They were on the door. They were everywhere. They're in the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, it's like they heard the call and they came out and I was itching. It was like my first experience. So I was grossed out. Um, but what was most surprising was people as we were closing them because we have to close you we can't allow you to you know operate with vermin um, people were banging on the door customers were angry that we were closing this place they were ready to come in and get their lunch buffet you know and it's a beautiful place <laughs> and we're just like you have no idea what's going on in the kitchen and we're helping you out right now but i'll never forget they were they were angry they couldn't get in there that day um so yeah so closing for vermin off to the left is a floor sink that's actually at like a dollar store I'm um, just overflowing. It's, it's, it's considered improper wastewater um, disposal, which is something that could get a restaurant or a food facility closed if you can't dispose of your waste. So I walked in and it was just, for whatever reason, gunked up and overflowing. So we had to take some action and, and get, that, get that cleaned out. So these are just a few pictures of what I might see in my day-to-day -day life. Um, they get much more extreme than this, um, much more exciting sometimes, but uh, this just happened to be what was in my work camera camera roll. All right, and actually the last slide, and then I'll wrap it up and take questions, is like, what what is environmental health in COVID now? Like, what is life for us? Um, life has changed, right, for all of us. Um, I don't think it mattered. I, obviously, teachers, right, we're talking to each other virtually for school. Like, that was only something you did for college online classes not too long ago. Um, so life has changed, but as an enforcer, in a regular, as a regulator, it has really changed for us. Um, it's, I'll say it's sometimes very challenging right now on an emotional type of level, more so than it used to be, because you get to know people, you know, you get to know the people and your business owners and you want to see them succeed. And you generally, often we generally like them as people and to see them and just flat out suffering some of them right now, right? People are losing their businesses, they're losing their livelihoods. Um, and then you come in there and you're like, hey, this is 50 degrees, you know, like it's, it's like, it's not the funnest thing to be doing right now, um, but we still have to keep the public safe even more so right now, probably, right? So, so mask and social distancing are affecting us too. We gotta wear masks when we're in the field. We have to be trying to social distance. You know, if you're in a cook line that's only five feet long, it's kind of, you know, you're, hey, you might have to say, hey, I need you to kind of step out the kitchen for a minute. So you got to really work around the social distancing. We're doing modified inspections. So we're not doing our full on inspecting right now. We're not we're probably going to be worried about your dirty shelving, right? We're going to be more just focused on the critical stuff to keep people safe. Um, we're responding to COVID public complaints. So we are enforcing the health officer order. So unfortunately, there are going to be people who just don't want to comply. Um, you know, there's businesses that don't want to close. There's businesses that don't want to stop letting people eat inside. It's just the nature of it. I understand why they feel the way they feel, but um, the public complains about things and we respond. Um, health officer and um, enforcement. So like I said, we're enforcing. So they have started like pooling permits and doing some other more drastic measures to try to get people to comply with the orders. Again, you know, may or may not be the funnest thing to do, but we're trying to keep it fair for everybody. Um, remote office. So many of us are working remote now. So we might come into the office when we need to. Most of us are self-sufficient to just work from home. You kind of, we have our own districts. Um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about that, but we have our own districts we're assigned to. So I actually inspect in pretty much all of Pinole, parts of San Pablo, parts of El Sobrante and a tiny part of Richmond. So I am the like, so for Fitzgerald um, in Pinole where the in and out and all that, that all is my area. So I inspect all the food restaurants there. So I pretty much know my area, what I need to do and I can just go out and do it. So we're, we're pretty much remote and that's kind of nice actually. Um, and then disaster service workers, 
so this is not just environmental health specialists. I think actually a lot of county government type agencies, if you work for a government, you can be called in as a disaster service worker, which is basically means if something happens and they need hands on deck, you could be one of those hands. And that's just a part of your employment with most government agencies. Environmental health, we are often called. Uh, like I said, as of yesterday, I'm now helping with the vaccine rollout um, in Contra Costa County. So I'll be transporting the vaccines, making sure they stay in temp and maybe sitting at clinics all day, protecting the vaccines, you know, which is interesting. As long as I don't got to stick anybody, I'm okay. Um, so I'm a disaster service worker as of yesterday. So I came into work and now for the next couple months, this is what I might be doing. So things could change. Um, you've got to be flexible, but you know, a lot of us, I'm a parent, a lot of us are working parents and stuff. So the department's very understanding and supportive of us. Um, yeah, and then lastly, before I take questions, I'll just say, so my route to becoming um, an environmental specialist was the scenic route. So I want to encourage you guys all, when I got out of high school, I think I applied to like one college, <laughs> Sac State, I got in, so that's where I went. Um, in hindsight, I wish I had maybe looked into some community colleges, you know, because some of the best education I ever got actually was at community colleges. So I went to Sac State. I graduated high school in 2005. I went straight to Sac State. My grandmother was sick. Um, I had a hard time focusing and I ended up dropping out of um, Sac State probably somewhere in 2011 or something like that. Um, I became a certified certified phlebotomist. So I moved on and started doing phlebotomy. I worked for the prison for a year. It wasn't my forte, but I don't want to discourage anybody from being a phlebotomist. Um, then I decided, you know, I wanted to go back, finish my degrees. So I went to Solano Community College. I obtained an associate's degree in 2012. Um, in 2015, I became a mother and I uh, went back to pursue my bachelor's while working. Um, I worked as a lab tech in a microbiology lab. I went to Cal State East Bay because Sac State, I think, was impacted for this, the major I wanted. I graduated 2016 with my bachelor's, so it took me actually 11 years to get my bachelor's. So I want to say to all of you guys, definitely get out of high school and go with, you know, full force, but there's no right way to do it. There's no, you know, there's no blueprint. Don't feel that you have to do what everybody else is doing. Like I said, it took me 11 years and here I am. So you can, you can always accomplish any goal you want to. Um, 2016, like I said, I graduated. I sent my letter and my transcript off. I got the letter, I think within months to, to train. Contra Costa was hiring in January. I got hired. And within less than a year, I was actually a trainee with Contra Costa County. It happened that fast. Um, I got registered in December, 2019. So now I'm a registered inspector and I have a career that supports me and two children. So, um, I just want to encourage you guys all that whether you have the right, and I fell into this career. I was pre-med a long, long time ago. I thought I was going to be a doctor, um, but, you know, just living life and always be open to learning, always be open to anything that you can learn, extra skill and extra training. I'm one of those people I want, I'm going to sign up because knowledge is always going to help you down the road. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me and my career and the environmental health career. And now I'll open it up to you guys if you have any questions. Thank you so much for that. That was great. Um, if you guys, oh, we do have one more question already um, from Miriam. She said, what tips would you give to a person that wants to follow this career? Tips, okay. Um, I'll ask you this question. Are you meaning educational or just like personal, professional, or I guess I'll just cover them all. Uh, my first tip would be keep in mind the educational requirements. So if you, many of you guys, I'm sure, are going to be getting ready to head out to college and onto your next steps, which is congratulations to all you guys. I have a lot of respect for all you guys making it through this COVID era. You know, you guys are very strong. So kudos to all of you. Um, but keep in mind the educational, the science requirements, right? So if you had that science in high school, great. If you have an opportunity to do those sciences and maths in high school, take it. Um, get all the foundation, take the right classes, right? Because like me, I graduated with my bachelor's. I had to go back to a community college and take algebra, chemistry, and then organic chemistry. So it took me an extra year because I didn't do it in my, um, my undergrad. So just keep that in mind. This is a career you know you would like to get into. Get those sciences in your, in your undergrad and just save yourself a lot of time. Um, another tip would be if you have an opportunity to work, or shadow or volunteer in fields of public 
like health or um, or healthcare or even environmental health do that. You know, like I said, I was a microbiology um, lab tech for like I think four years, and they actually knocked off like six months of my training because of my experience as a lab tech. So everything you do can help in the long run. Great. Um, the next one is what made you like your career now? Was there a time you doubted your interest in it? Yeah, you know, I'm still waiting on my lotto win, but I think, you know, in the meantime, this is <laughs> this is not too bad, right? We're all going to win that 600 million. Um, I like my career. I, I'll be honest. So the retail food part of it is not my favorite. You know, I'm one of those people that I don't really want to be anybody's dirty kitchen. I'm not even my own house. So that sometimes is just not my favorite thing to do. Um, but you have to just be open to, to doing what you have to do. Um, but there are days like when I had to close a restaurant a couple weeks ago, right? In the middle of COVID, I have to close you. You've just been closed for months. You're suffering. You know, it's hard. It's, it's heart wrenching, but there's roaches in your kitchen. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, days like that, you just don't love it. You know, you don't love what you're doing, but you have to remind yourself, this is my job. I'm keeping people safe, right? Cause you don't want anybody coming here, buying anything and then getting sick. So, um, it's going to just, I think every career, I don't think any job in the world, I'm 33 and I've never had a job yet that there's some days I just like, okay, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, just like school. Um, but you find what you love. Like I said, I love the educational part. I love learning. Um, now I'm doing body art and disaster service. So this career, things change. You can do so many different things. So yeah, just hang in there if there's a day that you're feeling like that. <laughs> it gets like that sometimes. Um, <laughs> do you work in teams or do you work alone most of the time? Most of the time we work alone. So this career specifically in this county, I can't speak to every county, but Contra Costa, we have a lot of autonomy, which means we have a lot of freedom. So when you get hired at these positions, they're gonna be really making sure that you can manage that freedom responsibly. Um, so nobody's telling us where to go every day. Nobody's tracking us every day. Um, we pretty much come in, well, now we don't even come in. So, um, but we used to just come in, you set your schedule, you you do what you're supposed to do. You have your numbers, you know what you need. We set our own appointments. We set our own everything. Um, the only time you work with another inspector in the field is maybe if I'm working with my Spanish speaking and I need a Spanish speaking inspector, or if I'm helping somebody like, so if we're approaching an unpermitted vendor, somebody that might be selling something at, on the street, we wouldn't go by ourselves. So when there's issues of safety and things, we will team up. Um, but generally I have that whole panel and that's my district and I'm out and I'm doing what I'm doing. Your supervisors can track what you do kind of at the end of the day, but there's nobody breathing down your neck. You have a lot of freedom. Um, and that's actually one thing I really love about this job. Does Contra Costa offer student student internships? We did have a couple interns. And I don't know when that might be coming back on, but we did have some interns. Um, I want to say early last year, pre-COVID, we had maybe two or three interns. Yeah, so that is something, you know, and maybe uh, Shirley, or shoot a shoot an email over to Jocelyn, our director, and kind of keep in loop with her when that comes back around. But we did have some interns. Um, they weren't necessarily out in the field with us because of probably legal reasons, but um, they were in the department, they were doing different projects and, you know, putting that time on their resume and applications, I'm sure. So yeah, there are intern and sometimes shadowing opportunities with certain de departments. Do you recommend people to look into what you trained for to be in this job? Um, is your job sometimes difficult if you work in teams? So what I trained for as far as just I don't know if I'm understanding what I trained for to for instance to be a specialist or could you repeat that question let me do you recommend people to look into what you trained for to be in this job I guess like have um a little bit of a a background of it before getting into the job oh okay um yeah I think for all of you guys you know um school is an investment in yourself and your career and your future and I think today, now more than ever, I think all your teachers agree, right? You, you want to you wanna go to school for your passions. I don't want to discourage anybody from doing that, but you want to kind of make sure that that is hopefully going to give you a, a good living down the road. Um, so whatever you go to school for, yeah, it's research those careers, see who's hiring, how much are they making, what is the requirements? Um, so when I was looking into this career, it was very much a research project for me because I had kids at the time. So I'm like, hey, if I'm going to invest 
this time, what's going to give me the biggest payout? So that's how I ended up in environmental specialist. I loved the, what we do. It wasn't just a money thing, but I definitely looked over job descriptions, working conditions, you know, um, and that's also a good prep for interviews down the road. Always read the job descriptions, always think the job duties. Those are, you know, those key words. So yeah, if you want this career, look into it. If you say, hey, I want to go Maybe I want to live in Washington one day. We'll check out Washington, see what their environmental specialist is, who hires, how much do they make, you know. Um, always try to plan to the best of your ability. Life is going to happen, but plan where you can. What other career opportunities are possible with your extensive background? Ooh. So a lot, actually. You're probably going to still be called the environmental specialist, right, or safety specialist. Um, you can go into safety. Um, so like Kaiser, a lot of them have like OSHA safety specialists, people who are going to be making sure that you're safe on the job, you could do that. We have people who have come from the manufacturing industry, so you might be in a food processing plant. Uh, we have inspectors who have gone on to work for the state, for the feds, um, they, they all hire environmental specialists um, and you know, six figure careers. Um, I think with this license, you can actually start your own business. You can do some certain type of plan reviews. You might be able to build septic tanks. So you can actually actually start out and do some things if you wanted to go start your own business with not all areas, but there are areas that our license allows us to kind of, you could work for yourself if you wanted to. So there's a lot of opportunities um, just for the skill sets you would have. Do other states accept certifications from California? Yes. California, I think New York and the couple other Florida, maybe some of the big ones. Those are like the states where if you get licensed there, you're pretty much good everywhere. Not always. Um, there is a national certification that you can get for environmental specialists. Most of us don't get it because it's not it's not needed here in California. California trumps it, but you can get nationally licensed, I do believe. Um, so we had I had a coworker who just we, we just, she just left last month, or I think in November, she moved to Virginia with her and her husband. Um, she was a licensed inspector. Uh, they didn't require licenses in Virginia. So she actually went in and got paid almost, almost equivalent to what she was making here. Um, and already kind of had talks about, you know, moving up because of that licensing. So it doesn't mean that you have better knowledge necessarily than anybody else in other states. It just means that California has said, hey, you've met everything, you're licensed to do this. It is a perk. It's just like a, I think, a equivalent to think of like a nursing license. Your California license may not be taken everywhere and be accepted, but it's going to be like that first stepping stone. And I think this will be our last question. Um, who or what influenced you to choose this profession? Mm, that's a good question. Um, great leadership, I will say, a great director. I have been really lucky in my careers, because I've had a couple of them, to have great leadership. And I think as you, you know, start working, you realize that being a good leader is not just making sure they're doing their work, but sometimes that mentoring. So I had um, a director, her name was Katia Ladeen. She was a PA, I think a doctor, yeah, she had a doctorate. She was the director of the Solano County Public Health Lab and I was a lab tech. And she gave me a lot of opportunities to learn and grow and do all kinds of things. She's actually the one that suggested this career. I had never heard of this career before. I had heard maybe of a health inspector, but never really thought about it. Um, she set up for me to shadow the inspectors in Solano County. Um, so I actually got a behind the scenes before I decided to do this. And um, she's just like, hey, I think you'd be really good at this career. I'm like, okay, well, hey, I'll check into it. Um, but I didn't go into college knowing anything about this career. Sorry, you guys are really loud there. I didn't know anything about this career. It kind of fell into my lap and I'm really glad it did. But I would say that that director encouraged me to look into it and she supported me going to get the classes and stuff. So um, yeah. So when you guys are employed in different places, you know, if you get to be mentored by people who have more experience, more wisdom than you, always take those opportunities. Um, a lot of times it's the people that we know that kind of help open the doors and get us, you know, into the places we need to be. Well, thank you so much for coming. To it was great. It was amazing. I really appreciate you taking your time. I know things are difficult. We do have, um, Chef Kevin, who came on, he didn't get to come in in the beginning, but, um, and Chef Cindy and Jason, um, but thank you so much. I think on behalf of IHTA and the district, we appreciate you so much and everything that you do. 
the thank you guys and if you need any you know contacts down the road please keep my information reach out to me those hyperlinks will take you to the state websites where you can print out all the requirements and you know have it on hand for the students if they like and yeah if you need anything in the future just just give me a holler thank you guys so much for having me this has been a blast and students can we give them a great awesome like verbal thank you thank you reactions <laughs> And thank you guys for your wonderful questions. You guys have been awesome. So I'm going to stop the recording.